Our text is from the Gospel reading. And Peter said, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursed is withered away. And Jesus said unto him, Have faith in God. By now you have figured out the schedule. Days Jesus spends teaching in the temple court, night in some park or suburb outside the city. On Sunday, he entered Jerusalem to a tumultuous welcome. On Monday, he chased the money changers out of the temple with the unforgettable words. It is written, My father's house is a house of prayer of all nations, and you've made it a den of thieves. And now it's Tuesday. Jesus and his little company are on the road into the city for the third time. And just then, they came to a familiar spot in the road. How could they forget what had happened at this very place just yesterday? Yesterday morn, they saw it off in the distance. A beautiful fig tree, enough to whet the appetite of any hungry traveler, standing beside the road, deeply rooted, sturdy, trunk, wide-spreading brow, full of foliage. But on looking closer, Jesus found that the boughs were barren. No buds, no blossoms, no green figs, no ripe figs. No figs at all. Beautiful to look at, but barren. So Jesus says to the tree, May no man eat fruit of you henceforth forever. They saw him do it. They heard him say it. But what in the world did it mean? Well, think about it for a minute. Doesn't it remind you of something that you just saw? Something beautiful to look at on the outside, but empty on the inside. What? That our temple, the golden temple sitting high on Zion's hill, with its gleaming spires, towering pillars, marble porches, spacious courtyards, the pride and joy of every Jew on earth. Teeming with religious people and religious clergy and religious offerings and religious activities and religious programs. But a church, like a tree, cannot hide and it cannot lie. It's fruitful or unfruitful. And where's the fruit? The temple was as active as a beehive. Problem is, God don't want your beehive. Where's the prayer? In the house of prayer. Communion. Your spirit with God's spirit. God's spirit with your spirit. Personal sin and God's grace. Human failure. Divine forgiveness. Human helplessness and divine sufficiency. Some people say this was childish petulancy on Jesus' part to curse an inanimate object. To vent his anger on a tree is not like the good and gentle Jesus. Oh, really? That's how the story started. John the Baptist called to repentance, remember? Bring forth fruit. Worthy of repentance, for the axe is laid to the root of the tree, and every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit, hewn down and thrown into the fire. But Jesus told the parable about the orchard owner who says to his manager, Behold, these three years, 
I've come looking for fruit on this fig tree and I find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? But you can't have Jesus any old way you want him. Skipping over the embarrassing scenes, uh, politely looking the other way, pretending that they are not there. You gotta take Jesus on the whole of his life and character and conduct. You cannot have Jesus blessing the little children without Jesus cursing the fig tree. And you can't have Jesus stilling the storm without a Jesus who trashes the tables of the money changer. Man, it's fatal to forget either his compassion or his wrath. Well, they couldn't pick up on that. Could not believe that their holy temple was like a barren fig tree. I mean, the money changers seemed more real than Jesus' words. That, well, the same way you and I can't believe that God would ever curse America, the beautiful, our country, our community, our church, our lovely lives. And so Jesus tells them, have faith in God from whose searching eyes. Nothing is hidden. Have faith in God and trust that he sees the true state of affairs. Have faith in God, whether he comes to you in mercy or in judgment. Have faith in God. For he's never fooled by outward appearances or the way things may seem to be. Have faith in God. If all of us here this morning, from the little girl whose mother just slipped her a lifesaver, to the college kids trying to stay awake, to the woman who comes from an abusive family, to the corporate vice president who thought about suicide twice the last week. If all of us were to throw onto a pile our burdens and our cares and our fears and our doubts and our disappointments, what a mountain it would be. Impassable, insurmountable, immovable. Don't believe in mountains. Jesus said, have faith in God. Verily I say unto you, if you were to say to this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, in no wise doubting in your heart, but firmly believing that what you say will happen, it will be done. I could complicate this for you with a lot of exceptions and explanations about your selfish prayers versus your sacrificial prayer. But I ain't going to do it. The problem isn't that you believe too much in prayer. The problem is that we believe too little in prayer. Mountains are nothing to God who made them. There are no limits to God, no barriers to God, no burden too heavy, no road too steep, no path too trying, no, no storm too strong, no guilt too great, no grave too deep for God and those who have faith in God. Prayer is one fruit of faith, Jesus said, and so is forgiveness. When you stand to pray, if you've got anything against anybody, forgive so that your Father in Heaven will also forgive you. Ann Tyler, author of many novels, has a fascinating scene in one of them. It's about Eon, 18-year-old kid, got the world by the tail. All-American family, devoted parents, a sister who loves them, a big brother who is his best friend, a high school sweetheart, and plans for college in the fall. Eon sees something, then assumes something, 
then says something that leads directly to the death of his brother and then the death of his brother's wife who leaves three small children behind. No one else knows what Eon has done. But the guilt is eating him up. Day and night he can't eat, he can't sleep, he can't enjoy the charms of his girlfriend. He's haunted by the devastating wounds of his parents' life and by the, the fright on the faces of those three orphan children. One evening during Christmas vacation, he's walking home. He hears the strains of an old hymn coming from a storefront church. The sign over the door says, The Church of the Second Chance. God, I love that. Eon slips in, quietly sits down amongst this crowd of losers and also ran. And when they're requesting prayer, Ian asks that they would pray for him. They do! But silently, and not very long either. On his way out, the preacher says, Well, was your prayer answered? Oh, the dice break you. The crushing guilt. He pours out the whole sad story and says, do you think I'm forgiven? Heavens, no, the preacher says. I'm not. I am, says with his eyes. Oh, no, no. Well, I thought God forgives every day. Oh, he does, says the preacher. But you can't just say, I'm sorry, God, and then walk away. You got to make amends. But what if there are no amends, the answer? What if the things are too broken to be fixed? Well, that's where Jesus comes in. He will help you try to fix the things that are broken, but only if you try to fix them. But how? You take care of those three children. Whoa. And then the story takes off. Now that's not exactly precise theology. God, for Jesus' sake, forgives sins freely and fully, unconditionally, for Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, man, the debt's paid. But there is a kernel of truth in that conversation between Eon and the preacher. It doesn't cut it for you to say, I'm sorry, God, and then walk away. See, Eon doesn't want forgiveness. That's true. Eon wants to feel good about himself again and be free from the consequences. But that's not forgiveness. That's self-centeredness. you got to carry through, Jesus says, and he repeats it. If you do not forgive, then your Father in heaven will not forgive you. It's got to be more than, I'm sorry, God, and you walk off. Because if you don't carry through, it isn't there. Forgiveness, I mean. For the simple reason, you cannot give what you do not have. Mercy cannot be explained to somebody who knows nothing of mercy any more than forgiveness can be explained to somebody who's hardened to forgiveness. Like the tree, you can't lie and you can't hide. The fruit is there or it isn't there. God created us and equips us to bear fruit, the fruit of faith of prayer and forgiving. But believe me, Jesus says, God is looking for it. Amen.